Now, I'll go deep into the detail in the next slide of the Tilenga project estimates. Uh, and I'll try and show you because the discoveries of oil are in the place called uh, Bulisa, where we have the Tilenga project operated by Total. And then we have down south Kingfisher operated by Sinok. For the Tilenga project where there is a major discovery, you'll have many types of trucks required. You have soil trucks, you have flatbed trailers, you have gasoline tankers, you have mini buses and buses transporting workers. Over 40 or 200 of them every day moving truckers around and people around there. So these are all requirements. If you go to the next Kingfisher, I'm trying to go through them because I'm sure we'll have a time to discuss. Uh, you'll see also a lot of demand in the next slide from Kingfisher and the next one from King uh, Eco Project Estimates. So you can see between first oil, you realize that you'll have about 450 per month trucks moving up to 630 in the area for that period a month after FID. So that movement and you divide that, you see how many trucks will be moving per day. If you go to ECOP, that is the East African crude oil pipeline of 1,445 kilometers, there are also a lot of equipment needed, a lot of trucks needed for soil, for, uh, for delivering of the pipelines because they are going to be uh, delivered in different places, uh, for m minibuses, for transporting people, mixers, a lot of requirement is needed. And that's what we're talking about, logistics. Now, fortunately, logistics is not only about trucks, it's not about movement, but there's also some heavy equipment, like the lifting and moving equipment that, uh, that is needed, including cranes, including uh, loaders, forklifters, all these are needed for the oil and gas sector. So the logistics requirement is huge. We have not yet even defined the refinery one because the engineering, uh, front-end engineering and design of the refinery is still ongoing. So the logistics requirements are huge. Now, where do Ugandans come in? Government passed a policy, government passed laws that support the logistics sector in Uganda. And one thing that you rightly mentioned, Mr. Toa, is that the logistics transport has been ring first for Ugandan companies. What do I mean by ring first? It can only be provided by Ugandan entities. So the <coughs> opportunity is there. You realize you have all these equipment, 7 million tons of equipment coming in. You'll have a lot of infield transport required, sand, concrete, all that. So are you ready and do you have the equipment? Do you have the facilities? Do you have, can you play in the sector? And that's what we've been talking about. So as Ugandans, one, we need to understand that Uganda is landlocked, but it presents an opportunity for people to do businesses. Number two, we need to know that the logistics is ring fenced for you. But remembering fenced does not force you to participate. You have to show interest, participate, for us to be able to implement the requirement of the law. Number three, where the packages are too big, please call for a joint venture. Enter a joint venture or go into subcontracting if you cannot handle the packages, if the requirements are big. Number five, number four, oil and gas standards are key. Please take note of them. And lastly, the law can only allow you to participate if you're registered on the national supplier database. And that's what we've been talking about. So for me, logistics is a good opportunity, and I'm glad that we have a session here speaking, basically, talking about logistics, oil and gas sector. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you very much, James Musherure. That was a very, very insightful one. And I could see the numbers. And from the last time uh, when we did the industry baseline survey, we actually found out that um, you had um, we were, we were expecting about 1 million metric tons of goods and equipment coming in. Now you mentioned 7 million. That is a huge amount of uh, 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 tonnage that is coming into the country. And I think it's also very interesting for us to look at the perspective, not just from the, you know, the trucks, but also the passenger vehicle part of things, you know, areas that we, we, we can easily get into. And I think that's a very interesting one. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, just to let you know, this event is brought to you by Sinok Uganda Limited in collaboration with JP Wong Energy and the Sandvik Business Incubator Limited. And we are glad to have these conversations of local content brought to you closer. Now, the next person who's going to present to us is a very interesting brother of mine, Timothy Tigaikara. Timothy Tigaikara is the Senior Contracts Manager 
at Sinok Uganda National uh, Sinok Uganda Limited. One of the quick questions that we would want, of course, to have answered as Timothy presents is, what is it that a Ugandan business can do to supply an oil and gas company? Coming from an oil and gas background, I remember that for many Ugandan businesses, it was a trick to get into the sector. So, Timothy, what does it take for a local business to get engaged in the oil and gas sector in this area of oil and gas? Thank you, Tony. Good morning, my fellow viewers, and uh, good morning, viewers, and my fellow panelists. I will also remove my mask, and we start our show. Yes, I'll first by giving a brief about Sinoc <coughs> for the interest of our viewers. Sinoc is one of the oil companies that is licensed uh, together with Total E&P to develop our Albertine region, the oil assets we have down there. So, FID was taken, no, feed was done in 2017. Feed is the front end, end engineering design, which in basic terms is like the architectural design of a house. So they came up with the plans, the quantities, the weights of what has to be moved to the, our Kingfisher field. Kingfisher is around 100 kilometers from Hoima. So right now we are going to another phase. The plan is done. You have to build a house. So we have to move equipment from wherever they are manufactured and brought here to Kampala then moved up to the field. But I'll break through the statistics. I agree with James, but the James gave a baseline requirement of 7 million tons. I'll give a small brief because Sinoc does its plan for its own field. So I'll ask the panelist to, uh, sorry, I'll ask the studio to put some slides from our side so we can take it from there. And uh, as they put the slide, I would like also to say that logistics is on the critical path for the development of Kingfisher area. So being on the critical path means it's very key for the success of this field development. And there's nothing we can do to make we, we have everything to do to make sure there's no mistake at this point. What we are trying to say is to get the best candidates to deliver these projects for, for CNOC so that first oil is a, arrived at at the shortest time possible. So from the time we start pre-qualifying suppliers up to the time we reach at contract signing, there's no room for any mistake. We have to get the best candidates to deliver this project. This is a national project. It's not an individual's project. The oil companies have a big stake in it. The government of Uganda has the biggest stake on it. We are in this. So we are looking for a partner. We are not looking for someone to do a deal and I'm a supplier. We have done our surveys of the market requirement and we are aware of the requirement for logistic services. One of them is these services has to be delivered by a Ugandan company, a Ugandan registered company, or a Ugandan individual, as long as you have capacity. So I'll start by breaking this into how we divided our tenders. We have four packages for the tenders. Basically, after the design was made, some of the equipment are going to come either from Europe, Asia, or US. So we have package one, that is the international freight forwarding. That means these goods have to move from those countries up to Mombasa. So that will be one contract. The second contract is the regional freight forwarding. These goods have to move from Mombasa up to our field in Kingfisher. On top of that, for example, if they are constructing a central processing facility, there's a lot of civil works which are going to be entangled with them fa putting up that facility. So there's an opportunity for the local supplier to provide transport for civil works, steel, things which are within the region. So the second package is what we call the regional freight forwarding. Then the third package which they mentioned is 
the infield transportation services. When these goods come and arrive our field, they are put in a store. We call it a supply base. But just the length of our infield road is six kilometers. That means you are moving from Kololo up to Ntinda. That is within our field. You have to move equipment to where they are to be sold. At the same time, you also have to move people to go and install. So that's another package for infield transportation services. The fourth and the last package under logistic services is the one for lifting and material handling. These equipments have to be carried and put on a truck or whatever carrier and then taken to where they have to be installed. But on top of that, we are looking at a company that is competent that will safeguard the safety of the equipment at the same time the safety of people. Because this is very key. These equipment are very expensive. We have four turbines coming. Each turbine costs around $15 million. Imagine you are carrying it and it falls down. The country, the players will lose that money. So we are very key on these uh, services. So that's why I'm trying to put out a point that we are going to look for competent companies to deliver these works. The beauty or the good thing is, according to our survey, we have capacity. So it's not that we are going to look for exceptional approvals to get someone from, say, Kenya or Sudan to come and do this. It's going to be done by Ugandans. The capacity is here. Only what we are telling the suppliers, go into partnerships. Because no one has capacity to do everything. But if you organized, you'll do this. Yes, uh, a point of clarity in under my background is we said these tenders had started or they were put to the market in late of December. And we received bids in May last year. But as you all know that after that, all contracts were suspended in August 2019. These tenders have expired and the environment has changed. During 2019, you could bring your container from Mombasa to Kampala in three days or four days. Right now, you have to do COVID test for your drivers. You have to wait for results, and then you have to move. When you find your driver is sick, you have to look for another driver. So a lot has been affected by COVID. So I can say we are going to re-tender them again. So everyone has an opportunity to start this process again or change the strategy. But we are aware of that. And uh, I'd like to take you through the statistics on uh, King Kingfisher requirements or expected quantities for logistics. For the oil and gas materials and equipment, we are looking at uh, around 1.6 million tons to be moved. So those are equipment for the likes of the turbines, casing and everything. Then we have also the rig equipment and well consumables which have to be moved around 20 21,000 tons. In total, we are going to move around 1.65 tons. These are estimates, but they give an indication. This is only Kingfisher. The 7 million is includes the pipeline, includes Tilenga, and other oil-associated projects. So from there, we shall need for just uh, oil and gas materials, including the rigging rig materials which will be coming in from abroad which are sourced globally around 1800 truck loads that is between 300 and 400 trucks will be on kingfisher every month for the period of six to eight months then you'll also have nationally the cement the the timber the sand that is going to be moved within the region that's where the trick is. We have 80,000 truckloads. I can't explain the number of trucks needed. So the opportunity are immense. And as CINOC, we are looking for the best candidate. We are encouraging partnership. With that, I would like to take you through now the procurement process. If you are an investor in oil and gas in, in the area of logistics, how do I be the best candidate to take over this, <coughs> this amount of work? 
the standards are high for oil and gas. We don't allow trucks which are 1998 model. So we will have new trucks. Our safety manager will, will explain to you the trucks requirement. So I'll not go through into that. So, so as the CNOC, our procurement process starts by planning. So it's not like you wake up and you go to a supermarket and buy. So we do have a business need which we have already identified. We have a sourcing plan which is reviewed by our stakeholders. We have a contracting strategy which is guided by the, the procurement procedures which are from Sinoc International and Sinoc Uganda Limited as well as the petroleum regulations. We are compliant with the regulations. And also we go through the usual tendering process. Our tendering process is not different from any. It's the classical one. We start from expression of interest. We move at the pre-qualification of bidders, uh, intention to tender, packages are issued out, and we sign the contract. So with this, we are going through the usual things you do in any other entity. But we are very careful. We analyze what you submit. So one of the purpose today is to ensure that the bidders who will participate in this are not going to get it wrong. <coughs> we have bidders, they spend a full month preparing bids, and then on the date of delivery, they bring their bids late. So for us as CINOC, we lose. Maybe the bid that is rejected due to late submission could have been the best bid. On the same time, I look at the company. You have invested one month preparing bids. You've done partnerships. You've paid workers, and your bid is rejected. So these are things we are come here every quarterly to do conferences to help these suppliers don't make small mistakes like this. So I'll go into details. We are going to advertise for these packages. For sure, they are above five hundred thousand dollars, according to the petroleum regulation. Any tender above 500,000 US dollars has to be advertised and we shall comply. Mm -hmm. But when we put an expression of interest, all we need from you is a cover letter with the following documents your legal and regulatory requirements, your certificate of incorporation, and all NSD certificates, and all that. Simple as that. You add your available resources, just a list. We are not looking for detailed documents at this level. So the manpower, equipment, software, you just list them. In relevant experience and you are, we need to know how are you aware about safety for your equipment, for other people and your, your workers. Then we need a commitment to national content requirements. We want to see a statement saying that we are going to work to develop our nation. So the vendors that have ex expressed willingness and have the above minimum requirements, we invite them for the pre-qualification stage, which uh, I could have on the next stage. So we send you a, our pre-qualification questionnaire, which is very extensive. You need to fill it. The mistake I see here is most bidders, when we send them this PQ, they take it for granted. Mm. They wait for the last week, and then they start filling it. So in the last week, they realize, oh, I need a lot of things. And they don't feel everything, and they submit. And then, for us, it's like an exam. What you put is what we mark. Everything has a mark. So for example, if you have not put your national supplier database certificate, because you are rushing, you don't get a mark for that. So you are pre-qualified. The questionnaire is in three parts. There's the legal section, which looks at the vendor information, the legal existence, uh, NSSF, URL clearance, as well as other permits and licenses. But the technical part, which is also very key, because we measure the competence of a company at this level. So we look at your QHSE management systems, your past experience, uh, your manpower equipment, and your workload. Because if you are loaded with work, we don't want to load you more, and you fail to deliver this work. But also, if you don't have work, sometimes it makes sends a message. Why don't you have work in the past eight months? Do you have uh, issues, legal issues? Are your machines old? So we also have our assessment anyway. That will is usually sent in the 
requirement for instructions to bidders. We also look at the financial and management section of your pre-qualification document submitted. <coughs> your financial status is very key with your financing sources because uh, these are huge projects. One contractor may have a project of around $15 million. So there are no games. We need to know, is your bank supporting you? Are your financials supporting you? So this is our pre-qualification exercise. Also submit it on time <coughs> and submit all details. When you receive the PQ, give it attention. Don't throw it to your personal assistant and then she submits it without you reviewing as a supplier or one of the big players in the market if you want a contract with Sinoc because you'll be thrown out. Well, but uh, not to scare away people, <coughs> we've had a good improvement. I've been in this industry for eight, nine years. From what we used to receive in 2014 and what we are receiving in 2017, 18, 19, there's a very great improvement, which is encouraging. Uh, people have learned our supplier development workshops have helped. So everyone is serious. So it is competition. In the last packages, every package, every tender had at least eight to ten bidders who have reached that evaluation. So that is competition. So what entails our request for proposal? <coughs> Basically there are three major documents. We have the scope of work. This, the description of work, technical specification, all our requirements we need for that tender will be sent to you. Read them line by line to understand because that's the work you're going to deliver and that's what we're interested in. We give you a contract, you deliver the contract efficiently. We attach a model contract. These are technical and commercial or legal terms to be followed or applied at project implementation. These, these terms are very key because they bind you and they have legal cost implication. For example, we can ask for a certain insurance cover. If you have not read this, you may not quote for it. Two, most people don't take it that they accept every time we send. At the time of signing the contract, they change their mind. This one I didn't see. This one I can't do. No, you'll be disqualified at that time and someone else will take the contract. Oh, it will be a cost to you when you're implementing. Mm. Lastly, we've also put instruction to bidders. This one is clear, how you should prepare your bids what we expect, how we are going to evalu evaluate your tender. So don't take it for granted. Read through and put things. There are people who mix prices in their uh, technical proposals. You are eliminated because the instructions are clear on that. So what do we evaluate when you have submitted your proposal? Technically, we as I mentioned, we also look at your past experience, the available resources, delivery methodology, project organization structure, because we look at who is in charge of this project, what is his experience, quality assurance and quality control, certifications, because no one just gets a, an ISO certificate. That means you have something. And I, as I started, we are looking for competent companies to deliver this project. Any mistake we make, it's a mistake for everybody, the oil companies and the government. So we are serious on this. And unpriced commercial, we will look at the national content plan. Actually, for your information, anyone who has a better national content plan has a 5% advantage on price. Mm. So some people say, I'm a Ugandan company, so I'm expected to give 100% national content. No, document it. Show us how you use your materials, are they sourced locally, how you employ people, any knowledge transfer, you're going to go into partnerships. I know you may partner with someone who is not in Uganda. Show us your level. The legal and regulatory requirements, we look at uh, the legal status, uh, permits, clearance with the, the tax bodies, and all those disputes and litigation. Yeah, we are against bribery and corruption. We insist on that. So we'll talk at it on the downfalls. And uh, your physical office, conflict of interest. So we are saying here, no pocket company will do this work. It's assured. 
So we have serious companies. But the small companies should not be worried. The demand for transport is going to be huge. You will be contacted. At least if you have two trucks, someone will add it on his fleet. But for us, the contract we want to award it to someone, we are very sure. The pricing structure will be given to you, and we have rates which we analyze, and then we evaluate internally. That's not a big deal. So when we have finished evaluating and identified our best candidate, we go to our partners. They review what we've done. That is total. We used to have also Talo would review what we've done. We would go to our headquarters. They review how we've evaluated. Then we send a report to the Petroleum Authority. That is our godfather or parent. They also review and approve before we award contract. But after signing the contract, we go into negotiations on many issues, not, take it, not only price, uh, the other technical or contractual negotiations we go into. Uh, we make necessary clarification so that everyone is on, <coughs> on in line of what is going to happen and how it will be execu executed. We do stakeholder review and approvals. Uh, we also notify those who have not been successful and tell them these are the reasons, either your price, either your technical proposal, or your pre-qualification was bad. The document submitted did not meet. So all after that, we go into a kickoff meeting, we discuss with the winning candidate, and they ask the other documents that are needed for the contract to go through. Lastly, our, the, through experience as the CINOC, we identified some shortfalls we got from generally all tenders, not uh, oil logistics tenders only. So one, people submit generic documents. <coughs> you are in a bidding you are bidding for a tender with Karuma, <laughs> and then you get the same request for proposal from Sinoc. You carry the same document you sent to Karuma project to Sinoc because you don't have time or your staff are engaged. Now there's COVID, they're working from home. Please, when we're evaluating, that affects you. We don't accept generic. Be specific and work with us. Separate your proposals especially a price from an uh, unpriced because our evaluation process is we start with the other two, the technical and unpriced commercial. Those who qualify are the ones who are invited at price opening. So we don't want to be biased at that point. Then uh, provide supporting documentation, proof where necessary. Those the completion certificates, please send them, attach them in your proposals. Confidentiality is a must. When we take your documents, we don't share them with any other person, as well as when you receive our documents, please keep them for only your company. Um, people like lobbying. They run to PAU <laughs> because they know someone there. They run to State House. They know someone there. They go to Ministry of Energy. They even come to our head office to see the president of Sinog or other people who are important. Uh, my experience is no one has ever succeeded. Our industry is different. Lobbying doesn't work. So I'm telling the suppliers, don't fall into that trap of lobbying. Because personally, I evaluate maybe 10% of these bids. I have, a team in, I have a team in Beijing that do evaluation technically. I have a team supervising me here. PAU reviews this. Our partners review every document that comes. So who will you influence? So I'm advising you, forget about lobbying. Your paperwork, your capacity, your size of the company will win you a bid. Then we also accept alternative proposals. Deviations are welcome, but they don't have to change the intent. Our intent is to move our goods from wherever they are manufactured up to Mombasa, move them from Mombasa up to Kingfisher, then from Kingfisher we take them to wherever they're going to be mounted or installed. It's as simple as that. So if you have an alternative bid, you are going to have challenges or unless you keep the same intent. With that, in Chinese we say, she, she, thank you.
Thank you very much, <coughs> Timothy Tegaikara. That has been a very interesting one. I've really taken away the idea of lobbying. You know, um, in Uganda, we always assume that when you know someone in an office, the doors are open for you. But I guess what you're telling us is join the professional networks, networks that will actually grow you in this industry, like the Uganda Chamber of Mines and Petroleum, which I'm part of. But also what's very interesting, I think, is, and again, what, something that you've really mentioned that I think is very important, is the laxity of a lot of Ugandan vendors. We always assume, you know, so yeah, what is new about these oil and gas standards? And yet the oil and gas standards are very, very, very critical in as far as any contract is concerned. So I think it's very important for us as Ugandans who want to get involved in this sector to really think about how we can get away from this laxity mode and really understand the sector and participate better. But also the issue of bid management. And I remember also my time uh, while at uh, Total ENP. It was very common among a lot of Ugandan businesses not to understand how to work or deal with a bid. Pre-qualification stage was one of the toughest moments where health and safety was an area that where many of them would, pre, uh, uh, would fall off. And I know for sure, like you've said, the idea of rushing to throw in these bid documents in just one week, two days, three days, doesn't really make you credible enough to get onto these contracts. So it's very important for us to understand that as businesses, we have to be able to get our businesses better, understand the sector, be able to participate. You can join this conversation, this discussion that we're going to have on Slido. On Slido, you can use the code 13735. It's Slido.com. Slido is S-L-I-D-O dot com. And use the code 13735. Join the conversation. Send in your questions. And let's interact as much as we can. Now, we're going into the health and safety standard area. Many Ugandan businesses find this very unusual and not normal. But I must say that health and safety in the oil and gas sector is very critical to how we do business. I remember in 2017... One of the biggest challenges for many of Ugandans, or many Ugandans, was Sinuk, the Chinese, have their own standards. Total, the, the French have their own standards. Uh, Talo, on the other hand, have also their own standards, the, the European standards. And what we did in 2017, a project that I project managed, was to see how we can set standards for heavy good vehicles in the uh, oil and gas sector. This is something that we did with Petroleum Authority, Uganda National Bureau of Standards, and we are able with the oil and gas companies to be able to set these standards for Ugandan businesses to be able to um, support their businesses. Now, taking us through this is someone who deals in the day-to-day -day health and safety area of the logistics area, but also the oil and gas area. And of course, now I'll allow the senior contracts, sorry, uh, senior safety engineer, Mr. Patrick Rubega from Sinuk, to take us through what it takes for health and safety to be realized by a local business entity. Mr. Lubega, please. Uh, thank you so much, Madrata. <coughs> Allow me to remove my mask. Uh, good morning, viewers. Uh, my name is Patrick Lubega, as you said. Uh, today, uh, all this morning, we are going to look at uh, quite a lot of uh, requirements as far as QHS is concerned. Uh, there are quite a lot of um, requirements that are needed, especially from planning to closure of an activity. And then uh, when you look at the day-to-day -day works, uh, you, you imagine that uh, you have come to work and then uh, you go back home when you're either sick or when you uh, have uh, you're, you're having a half hand. So as health and safety, we try as much as possible that we try to put up some policies and uh, uh, also following the Ugandan regulations. Not only that, but also the international standards. So today, uh, my, my, my presentation will aim at explaining more about the QHSC requirements at each contractual stage. So you'll find that uh, Timothy has said a lot about this, but then you'll find that as QHSC we come in and play a very big role as in fulfilling our internal policies. So what do we need out of uh, our contractors to do? So uh, first and foremost, we would want to appreciate those who have been working with us as CINOC and those contractors who have been really so much uh, doing a lot of uh, QHSC work uh, with QHSC, we do uh, try as much as possible that uh, we work hand in hand with procurement, 
that is uh, contracts and procurement and at every level you find that uh, you shall have requirements and uh, in oil and gas QHC is a very key department so we expect every contractor to adhere to each and every requirement that we put as QHC. So I will basically look at the, uh, uh, the process understanding, the whole process of oil and gas. I will not basically uh, try to f uh, focus more on logistics, but I will look at uh, a holistic approach to all contractors. Uh, since this is our suppliers uh, development symposium, so I would think all contractors who are listening to us, who are viewing us, uh, would want to understand more about our KHSC requirements. Uh, why would we emphasize uh, more of contractors uh, QHSC management? Uh, you see, when we uh, talk about safety, when we talk about quality, when we talk about health and environment, you find most of the people saying, no, this is useless. But then there are some indirect uh, results that you get. There are unseen uh, profits that you get out of your, 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 your company. You can't see them, not until an incident happens. That's when you realize that safety is very important. So uh, why would we emphasize QHC or why would we emphasize a running system in your company as a contractor? One, it's because of the ethical and uh, moral reasons. And then secondly, legal reasons. And then uh, thirdly, and that's my last one, is financial reasons. So these are basically three reasons why we encourage uh, our contractors to dwell more on uh, looking at QHSC as one of the paramount uh, things to do before they start off any project. So you'll find that when we talk of, when we talk of ethical and moral reasons, once you get an accident, your company will be in, in, in uh, in danger, let me use that word. You'll find that you'll, you, you, you'll be talked about in newspapers, even internationally. You'll find yourself uh, being in uh, danger in terms of press release and so on. And then with legal, once an, a person gets an accident while, while at work, you find this person will not either get satisfied with compensation, so the end result will be to go to law. And yet, uh, 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 when, once you, that person goes to law or to the uh, to law, you will find that you pay as a company. You will pay a lot of money. So that's why I bring in this uh, this point of financial reasons. So, as Sinok Uganda, we try as much as possible that we induct our contractors during such uh, uh, quarter quarterly uh, supply development workshops to try as much as possible that we try to give you. Or to tell you what we what we expect out of uh, you. So, um, Sinoc as a company has got some core values, and our core values are safety first, environment at most, and then uh, people oriented, uh, and then equipment uh, integrity. So, what do we mean by this? This is just a summary of the policies that we have as Sinoc. But then we have summarized this, uh, these policies to come up with only four core values. So when we are carrying out evaluation of bids, these are the key values that we look at. Yes, you have presented your documents very well, but is there, uh, do, we, do we see some uh, such values that I've mentioned, like safety first? So now, once uh, contracts, or once C&P, contracts and procurements, comes up with a scope of work, they send it to us to review, and then we insert in our requirements as QHSC. I don't know whether most of you during the RFPs, I think you have ever seen these requirements. So uh, now this is the right time for us to uh, actually tell you that try as much as possible that you uh, understand these QHSC requirements. Once you fail to fulfill the requirements as as has, has been put or have been put in the uh, uh, the, the scope of work, then it means your chances of uh, not, not winning a contract will be very, very minimal or low. So that's why we are coming up with these uh, awareness campaigns or workshops to probably alert you and say, yes, uh, this is very good and the sector is very fragile. Therefore, we expect most of our contractors to follow what our internal system says.
Uh, I will dwell more on uh, uh, contractors running management system. Yes, this is something that is really good. Once you uh, have a system, a running system in place in your company, expect to have less incidents, expect to have uh, profits. Like I said when I was starting, that you may not know your profits not until you observe the safety procedures. You will not have accidents, you will not have injuries, and hence you will not spend on those. So therefore, what we are saying as CINOC, that try to come up with a running system. What do I mean by a running system, QHS running system? Uh, develop, first of all, you need to develop uh, uh, documents in terms of policies and procedures. So as CINOC, it's an international company, therefore we have to follow the international standards as far as oil and gas is concerned. So our major role here as QHS is to emphasize uh, more of uh, having or developing documents that will lead to having a running system. So once you develop, uh, you develop uh, uh, documents, you will have to implement them. You will have to implement what you're going to, what, what uh, you will have to implement, uh, whereby the documents are in place, you have drafted them, but then you just sit on them simply because you want to uh, have uh, a contract from CINOC, and then you forget implementing. So what we are telling our contractors is try as much as possible that once you develop or you draft documents, socialize them, roll them out, and then implement them accordingly. For whatever activity that you're doing, you'll get used once you come to any oil and gas company you'll be in position to adhere to our standards as soon of uganda limited so this is now my advice uh, to most of our viewers and the, and then the contractors try as much as possible that the first step would be developing and drafting documents that are health related, safety related, environment related. In other words, this will lead you to be certified on an ISO basis. You cannot be certified under ISO before these documents are drafted and implemented. I would also think uh, and also say that all activities under CINOC, uh, we recognize and follow the legal uh, uh, or the regulations of Uganda and also uh, the applicable standards and, the, and regulations. We don't only look at uh, our internal system, but rather we try as much as possible that we follow what the regulation says on oil and gas. For example, we have the HSC uh, oil and gas regulation 2016. This is purely our two tool that we use as we are running uh, the QHSC system in, King, in, in Kingfisher, in Hoima, in Kampala, or as CINOC as a whole. So we try as much as possible that we help the regulators to comply with the regulations that have been put forward. But also, not forgetting our own internal system. So whatever system that we have, it will, it will entail, or it will uh, make, uh, we shall make sure that all our contractors do adhere to it. So the first step is, are all contractors following our QHSC management system? If yes, right, that's good. Then how about the regulation, the national regulations, and then the international regulations? So now these are some of the things that we need to adhere to, or to comply to, especially when we are carrying out an activity. Uh, I will not say much on uh, uh, contract Contractors QHS evaluation process. Of course, Timothy has talked a lot about it, but what you need to understand here is QHSC as a department we do uh, involve or we do a supporting uh, work. So we try as much as possible that every at every stage of contract signing or contract award we are there. Okay, from planning. When I talk of planning when, uh, like I said, when C&P, for example, contract and procurement, when they come up with the scope of work, they uh, forward it to us to review, and then we add in 
our uh, requirements as QHSC. Then from there, the contract evaluation starts from there. And then at every stage, QHSC is evolved. So once you fail to attain some marks under QHSC, then I've said, and I've, I've already said this, that there are many more chances that you'll win this contract. So the first step to do for you is make sure that the QHSC system is clear in your company and try as much as possible that you socialize it and implement it. Because at the end of the day, during evaluation, we shall ask, do you have any proof of this? So when you look at the PQ questionnaire that uh, Mr. Gaikara was talking about, you will find that most of the questions that are within there, they are so much QHSC related. And you will find that if you don't have a running system, QHSC running system, it will be so hard for you to fill in those uh, questions in the questionnaire. So what we are trying to mean here is try as much as possible that the first step to do is try to develop and draft a management, HSC management system. And you start running it in your company. This will help you to have higher chances of winning most of these bids in Sinok Uganda Limited. Uh, yes, uh, to continue with that, like I've said, that under QHSC we are supporting team. So we support contracts and procurement. Therefore, at every stage, for example, under planning, pre-qualification, tender under award, pre-mobilization, uh, mobilization, execution, demobilization, and final evaluation and close out. And close out. So you see all these stages, we are always there as QHSC. And there is no way how you can jump one of them without us. Of course, right now you're seeing Patrick. The other day you'll see someone else. We are a team. So during evaluation, a team comes up, and then we crit critically analyze your documents that have been pro proposed to us. And then we will be in position to either make you pass or fail, based on what you have given us. So Sinoko's responsibility, uh, Ideally, when we talk about uh, QHSC, most of us, we may fail to understand what QHSC is. But QHSC is basically quality health, safety, and environment. Therefore, once we observe, once we observe that uh, there are some hazards ahead of our project, these are some of the hazards that we identify now during the time of, uh, of implementation. You have got, okay, you have got uh, a contract, yes? And then the next step is for you to implement. But then before you implement, what are you supposed to do? There are a lot of uh, things that we are supposed to, uh, to, 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 to do. One of them is, have you fully filled the PQ questionnaire? So the time is against us. Uh, Timothy talked about this. But you see, once you fill a questionnaire and you leave out a few of the gaps unanswered, then you lose max. The chances of you winning that contract will be very minimal. So what am I trying to mean here? Try as much as possible that once you are filling a questionnaire, fill everything and be open to us. Don't lie. Because everything that is there in the questionnaire would want to get evidence. So once you don't provide evidence, then there are lower chances of you getting into the system. You must have the running system. Then also there are key areas to consider during pre-qualification, running system, previous uh, uh, experience in management of HSC. With this, we'll, we will ask for some tools, like checklists, like toolbox meeting, and so on. Then you, you will have to uh, give us the emergency response plan. Uh, if necessary, the certificates for ISO, they are very, very needed under CINOC Uganda Limited. Patrick, thank you so much for that uh, presentation. We're going to get back into the Q&A at the panel session where you can explain more about some of these things that you mentioned. And again, very interesting things that many businesses or companies in Uganda do not really understand. I think it's very important for us to wait for the panel discussions where we're going to hear personal stories of businesses that have been through this and are waiting as well to get back into this. But also more information from Patrick, Timothy and James on what it takes for a local business to come in. Remember, you can join us and join the conversation on Slido. It's slido.com, S-L-I-D-O.com. And the code is 13735. Post your question, 
do not be afraid of whatever question there is. We always say, we always say, no question is stupid. All questions are great. So if you want to know more about the sector, I think this is a great opportunity. This is brought to you by Sinoch Uganda Limited in collaboration with JP Wong and the Standard Business Incubator Limited. We're going to take a break right now, and when we come back, we're going to get into the general panel discussion, send through your questions and your uh, concerns, and we'll be able to answer them. Thank you. Uganda, in partnership with JP Wong Energy and Stambik Business Incubator, will hold Sino Quarter for Oil and Gas Supplier Development e Conference. The theme Preparedness of Logistics Players and Entities for the Development Fairs of the Oil and Gas Sector in Uganda. Hosted by Tony Okoa Otoa, the Chief Executive Stambik Business Incubator. The discussions will include Arthur Kato. Oil and Gas Manager, Spidak Interfreight Uganda Limited. Jennifer Mujuche, Chief Executive Officer, Unifreight Group Limited. Patrick Lubega, Safety Engineer, Senok Uganda Limited. Timothy Tigaikara, Senior Contracts Engineer, Senok Uganda Limited. And James Mosherure, Senior National Content Officer, Petroleum Authority of Uganda. Watch the event live on UBC TV this Thursday, the 10th of December 2020 from 11 a.m. till 1 p.m. and on all UBC social media platforms. Pay your water bills using my Airtel app. Pay water bills using Airtel money to keep your water flowing. Open the my Airtel app with quick and easy steps. To pay for water, select pay bills under quick actions. Select water bills. Select NWSC. Enter NWSC account number. Enter area, then press next. Enter amount. Select Airtel money to pay and enter PIN to complete transaction. The Taxpayers Appreciation Season is here! We recognize, celebrate, and award Uganda's top taxpayers. Be part of the first online Bombayer Business Summit and stand the chance to win smart...
PIDAC Interfreight Uganda Limited. Jennifer Mujuche, Chief Executive Officer, Unifreight Group Limited. Patrick Lubega, Safety Engineer, Senok Uganda Limited. Timothy Tigaikara, Senior Contracts Engineer, Senok Uganda Limited. And James Mosherure, Senior National Content Officer, Petroleum Authority of Uganda. Watch the event live on UBC TV this Thursday, the 10th of December 2020, from 11 a.m. till 1 p.m. and on all UBC social media platforms. Welcome back to the second session. This session is going to be a panel discussion. And with me, we have been, or we're going to be joined by two very interesting players within the industry. Uh, this session is brought to you by Sinok Uganda Limited in collaboration with JP Wong Energy and the Stanbic Business Incubator Limited. My name is Tony Otoa and I am your moderator and I'm going to also be moderating this session where we're going to discuss more in depth what we have to do or how we have to be able to prepare ourselves to get involved in this sector that everyone thinks is very unusual, but for many of us, anyone can actually get into it. I am going to begin by introducing Mrs. Jennifer Mwijuke, who is the CEO of Unifried Logistics, who will also be joined by Mr. Arthur Kato, who is the oil and gas manager at Spedag Uganda, uh, uh, Spedag, uh, uh, Spedag uh, Uganda Limited. Um, ladies and gentlemen, this session here is one of the most interactive ones, and I encourage you to participate as much as you can. If you can, join us on Slido, and the code is 13735. Join us, contribute to these conversations, and I will read out all of your questions to the panel. But before we begin, I'll allow Madam Jennifer to come in and tell us how, what her experience has been. Jennifer is one lady who I have seen in the sector for some time, very resilient. Even when things went down, she stayed afloat. We want to know the magic. What did she do while the oil and gas sector was down to keep her afloat? But also, what did she do to get engaged in the sector? So Jennifer, it's your platform. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. And uh, good morning, uh, my colleagues, panelists, and uh, viewers. I'll take off my um, mask so that I can speak uh, clearly. As I've been introduced, my name is Jennifer Mujuche, CEO of Unifreight, and I want to appreciate uh, my colleagues, especially uh, the representative of PAIU, for the information and the engagement that they have been giving to us as logisticians for some time now that has helped us to prepare. Allow me also to appreciate representatives of SINOC, the supplier development uh, program that we have continually participated in has helped us to prepare. My colleague uh, from the same sector, I do rec I recognize you. And uh, I'm going to speak about two aspects. One is to share how Unified has prepared. And two, I'll touch on the inter industry preparation. For I believe that is the response we are giving in terms of preparedness. Unifreight is one of the local indigenous uh, local logistics companies that has been in the industry since 1996. I'm the founder and the CEO. And um, we've been in this industry providing three uh, specialized services in logistics. We do customs clearing, which was our original business. And we have diversified in trucking that is cargo transportation, and also we manage a CFS, what is called Container Freight Station at Port of Mombasa, as one of the 18 private-owned terminal managers at the Port of Mombasa. It's the only Ugandan terminal in Mombasa that is managed by Unifreight. Um, we have been prepared for oil and gas. I must say, I have not, we have not been able to win a contract, but we have made trials that I'm proud to share and perhaps that can encourage the rest of our Ugandans. Because I'm not worried, I will one day win a contract. I'm very confident about that. And so, um, since oil and gas journey started, I think like, uh, Timothy mentioned 2014, we, we tried to definitely be prepared. One of the areas that was very clear 
that was mentioned very clear by oil and gas from the word go was the quality uh, and health and safety preparedness certification. And so as Unifred, we began the journey to try and develop a system that prepares us to position us for oil and gas. And currently, for the last two years, we got certified and we are running an integrated management system that covers quality 19001, ISO 19001, uh, 2015, which deals with uh, quality that is specifically dealing with customer uh, management and customer satisfaction. We also have the system of environment 1401, 2015, that is covering matters of environment, taking care of standards to do with management of environment, and we also have the system of eight, uh, ISO 1801 that deals with occupational health and safety for people that uh, come to our business, but also our own employees. So as far as we are concerned, we are prepared in as far as that system. It's been running for the last two years. We are actually ahead of next year to have another external um, audit to renew our certification. Now, also as Unifred, we've been, I remember, we have had pre-qualifications twice with CINOC, but in, in, the, in our first pre-qualification, what we were told was the quality of our trucks. I did not sit back to even feel uncomfortable. I went back to CINOC and asked, why did I not qualify? And I was given feedback, which to me was very, very important. I am saying these examples that so that we can share and help even the rest of us. I am not the business person that likes eating alone. I share the knowledge that I have so that we can eat together, so that we can grow together. I know that time will come when we shall all eat. And so I went and asked, why didn't we qualify? And I was given that feedback, the quality of your trucks. So what have we done? We have increased our fleet and bought new trucks, brand new trucks, and we have now a fleet of 27 trucks, which I believe that we also have capacity to increase when those opportunities come. And I know that equipment, physical infrastructure is key in as far as preparedness is concerned. What we have also done is the construction of our own building at a workshop we have where our offices are located in Chireka. So we are not worried about our physical appearance, our physical presentation in as far as oil and gas is concerned. And of course I know business-wise, physical infrastructure is also evidence of success. And so that we have had to, to pay attention to that. We have a, work, uh, a workshop, we also have our own offices. And then another thing is, of course, when we talk about opportunities, and like the previous presenters, they have highlighted their requirements. As business people, it is about strategy. We know what our customers want. In this case, we know what oil and gas want. So all we are doing is preparing our resources to make sure they align with the needs of the customer. So when it comes to human resource, we are training our staff. Some of them have uh, uh, attended the um, training of Stanbic Incubation. Tony has been training us in, um, in bid management. That was an area we were struggling with. Oh my God, responding to the bids <laughs> of oil and gas is another area. Sometimes we have had sleepless nights paying attention to nitty gritties, to the details like Timothy has already been able to present. So we have been training, whatever training that has come, we have responded, we have been training. But also, I feel that at this point as Unifred, we can attract any talent to Unifred. I'm confident about that. I have poached some of the staff from good organization, <laughs> and I can still do that, because the preparedness has been intentional, and I'm doing that. So when the time comes for those specific tender requirements, I am confident that I can attract any, any talent to Unifred because human resource is key. That one I, I know. And I know that that is what is going to drive 
the organization to another level. Now, partnerships is very key. I have no doubt that that is where we are going. In one of the tenders we tried, I actually partnered with an international organization. For the last tenders that Timothy was talking about of May, even Total did, and we had pre-qualified until when they were, they were put on hold. So I know that partnership is going to be key. However, I know that the partnership are also, the, the international partners are also coming looking for who are Ugandans that can be trusted, that have integrity. I think one of the areas, and I'm proud for me, I think the partners I've had in the past have come to me because of that. And I'm very confident that I can attract again partners from the international side. Why? As Timothy was celebrating, and I want to appreciate Sinok for this matter, because I've participated in this tender. But I like your structure. The structure talking about the international freight, the regional, and then the local distribution. Definitely, I believe that all of us will find our levels, depending on the competence we've been able to develop. Because that structure is what we've always wished or needed to have. So it is OK for me to, to know that uh, when I get a partner, I will handle the international freight side. But we must have a relationship because we know ultimately we must have end in mind about the service delivery, about what the customer wants, so that we coordinate even from that time. That things are not going to land in Mombasa just because I have a contract of regional, I did not have any relationship with international. There have to be linkage. Logistics has been that way anyway. There is no single logistician that has competence to manage the requirement for any movement. We always work in partnership. So to us, to us as logistician, it has always been partnership. It has always been identifying international networks to work within as far as forwarding is concerned. So oil and gas is just making it now become a requirement or a reality, but that's what we've been, or perhaps for us Ugandans to wake up and say, look, I think we need to partner. So pre in, as far as preparedness about partnership, is about integrity, is about competence we have formed, is about indeed the training and preparedness that we are making. Before I came here, I was trying to look at our industry in general, now speaking about the industry. And I tried to do research or make some, 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 some quick research regarding the industry. I know that the requirement for participation in oil and gas requires we all um, register on supplier database. And so I checked and I was like, I realized that uh, we have over 100 uh, companies, about 128 companies that have registered that are participating in logistics in general. Which logistics includes, of course, transport, it includes warehousing, it include, into, includes, and transport is different. We have air freight, we have sea freight, we have water uh, transport. And of course, it is surprising that on water transport, we have one or two people that are tra tra uh, um, registered. That means, of course, that is the level of water transport. Ideally, it is reflecting how much water transport is being used in Uganda. Yet, it should be, or it could have been, the best, even when we talk about Central Corridor itself, because Central Corridor uh, is going to, they are already working on railways to, to Mwanza, and so water transport should have been better. But those are some of the areas that we could look at that have not, together as a group, both government and ourselves, to see how quick or how much we can be able to do. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the, the 128 companies, out of those, 42 are the ones purely in road transport. And looking at the requirements that have been mentioned, again, we can only say until when we come to that specification of how are we going to partner. If you have two, three um, uh, trucks and someone has 50. But I also know that Ugandans have been intentional on now investing in trucks. I looked at, because we have a CFS in Mombasa, and I've seen an increase in number of trucks that are coming in the country. All we need to do is now to indeed be able to touch on the numbers. But I know I have seen there has been increase of investment in trucks, and we are getting ready. Okay. Like I said, it is going 
to be very, very key for us to identify one another to see how we can come uh, a group in terms of partnership. Absolutely. Jennifer, we'll come back to you on that because, again, this issue of partnerships for me is a very crucial one. Mm -hmm. We've talked about 7 million tons. And if you think about it, there's no single Ugandan company that can even manage mm -hmm. a tenth of that workload mm -hmm. which means that as logistics companies you have to come together you have to liaise with one another and form the formidable uh, force that can actually take on this uh, challenge and again i think this is something interesting that maybe um Arthur, you will touch on in telling us about this whole preparedness on your side but before you go into it Arthur, the other thing uh, I, I hope by the way she's not going to port you you know she's seated <laughs> right next to you so i hope she's not going to port you eventually but i think what is also very interesting is the human resourcing I component of things you know but we're talking of all of this tonnage that is going to come into the country and if we talk about all of this tonnage what's really critical and crucial are the drivers do we have the right caliber of drivers do we have the right caliber of uh, tan boys who can be uh, able to support in this area are we training enough ugandans to be able because if you look at the guys who run the show most of them are Somalis or Kenyans or Tanzanians. I was privileged to be a tan boy in my first, it was actually in my first job. And I'll tell you one thing, this is an area which is destined for a lot of East Africans apart from Ugandans. How is it on your side at Spidag? How are you guys prepared? Uh, allow me to remove my mask. Thank you, Tony. Uh, my name is Arthur Kato from Spidag Interfreight. Uh, SPEDAG has been part of this industry for the last uh, over 10 years, since 2006 when this started. We've done a lot of work in the industry, both uh, locally in Uganda and within the region, and we've, we've done a lot of homework. And uh, as Tony highlighted, there's, when you look at the, the, the volumes coming into this country, when you look at the, the kind of equipment that has to be brought, there's, a lot, there's going to be a lot of heavy lift equipment, a lot of um, out of gauge cargo that has to be moved. All this requires uh, equipment that is certified, equipment that has been, um, has been uh, manufactured to suit our roads because Jennifer mentioned the infrastructure has a lot to be done. So currently, with the efforts being done by the government and with the, uh, the support of the, the the donor partners, a lot of work is being carried out. Roads are being expanded, but all this is being prepared for one thing, to receive this cargo. The drivers for this is basically uh, the movement. Uh, Timothy highlighted earlier that most of this equipment is going to be sourced from overseas, China, America. Once it gets to Mombasa, both for air freights and sea freights, they still have to be moved by road to these destinations. What Spedag Interfret has done, we've partnered with quite a number of local companies. We have done this in the past, and we support them. We do a lot of training for the drivers. We take them through simulations of how they need to uh, behave on the road, how they need to uh, r drive these trucks. There are standards. Oil and gas comes with a lot of standards. The way an ordinary company would move their cargo from Mombasa to let's say Kingfisher, the Sinox site, is different. There's, there's a lot that has to be done. Patrick here highlighted that um, safety is key. Before any journey, there's a lot that has to be done. You need to do analysis of the safety. You have to make journey management plans. As Predag Interfaith, this is, we've encouraged even our partners, the, the transporters. We have educated them on how GMPs are done. Uh, most of the, the, the standards for the trucks that have to be used they have to ha be monitored. They have to have in-vehicle monitoring systems, IVMS. All this has been an investment that we've done over the years. We've partnered with quite a number of trucking companies. We've had several, several interactions trying to come up with designs and models that work in preparation for this industry. Uh, for the drivers, most of them were going into an age of, 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 uh, of smartphones and so currently we have, we have designed uh, systems, there's one we call Perispo, where a driver is monitored from the time he sets off. It is a very small gadget attached to a, to a truck. Uh, what we try and do also, we, we do not conceal it from the drivers. They also, we educate them. They need to know what is being, what they need to do. What happens previously with the other projects that are not oil and gas related, we, you, you attach a truck and you don't tell the driver. The driver does something else. 
but with this we've taken an effort to train the drivers what is expected of them uh, the kind of health status they have to to have we have to make sure they're fit f the the fit for work uh, with today's trend, these days we don't, they don't encourage having more than um, one person in the truck because the kind of trucks that are being used, these are trucks that are new. Most times it's not more than five years old or brand new or not more than a thousand kilometers in terms of mileage. So the chances of those trucks breaking down are very minimal. So you find a driver is trained to make sure he's able to move a truck from Mombasa to Kingfisher alone, he's been trained on defensive driving, he knows what needs to be done. So there's a lot of work that has been done to, to prepare. And this not only is, 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 is not only to the drivers, this is also for the human resource. Uh, Timothy mentioned about lifting and uh, handling. There's a lot of cra uh, lifting that has to be done. Both at the receipt of this cargo in, um, in Mombasa or at the airport, You've had Hoima Airport is being developed. Uh, we're going to be receiving very big, um, like the Anat uh, Antonov aircrafts. These come with lots of turns. So for this cargo to be lifted on two trucks or moved from one rig location to another, a lot of safety precautions have to be done. So safety is something that they, for, for my, uh, our partners, they are uh, the people in the same business, we need to, <coughs> to take time and do, uh, put in place safety systems that we practice every day. Don't expect to fatten a cow on market day. It won't happen. The industry has kicked off. It's not going to wait for an, anybody. It's either you shape up or you'll be shipped out. So let's get on board. Let's uh, work, create partnerships. There's so many. I'm, I'm impressed that when you, even when you look at the national uh, supply database, there are so many safety companies that have set up in Uganda just to support this industry. Let's take advantage of that. Let's, the cake is so big, we all can take a part of it if we work together. Thank you so much. That's quite insightful, Arthur. And uh, now I'm going to go into Slido. Some questions have come in, and I think um, I'll begin with my brother, Jens Moshere, because um, it's very interesting. A lot of <coughs> Ugandans are very keen to see what strategies government has put in place to export the finished products as one way of earning much from the oil and gas. So let me just, if you don't mind, let me just fire you these questions, and then you can answer once. So there's that, the finished products from you know, the oil and gas uh, sector. What's the government going to do? The second question is, uh, Uganda being the hottest inland exploration frontier, the world is looking at, uh, at, at it. What plans are in place for Ugandans to benefit more than the rest of the world. So I think here this person is talking about local content. What is there that the government is, or, 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 or what is the government trying to do to promote more local content, to have more revenue staying in country as compared to it getting out of the country? And then the other question is, when is Kabale International Airport opening? What opportunities will exist for logistics, uh, logistics companies when it does? And again, I think, uh, James, you're well placed to answer that. And the final question for James would be, um, I think that is it for you, James. If you can just answer those three, and then we'll go to Timothy. I have some very interesting ones lined up for you as well. Thank you very much, uh, Tony. Uh, those are interesting questions. <coughs> uh, strategy for Uganda to export finished product. From the onset, uh, the government's uh, uh, approach, as far as oil and gas has been concerned, has been value addition. Uh, and I think one of the things that delayed uh, the issuance and kicking off of the sector was agreeing on how to deal with the product of oil and gas. Government chose deliberately to put in place a refinery, a 60,000 barrel refinery in Kabale uh, near Hoima. Uh, this is to do finished products. Whereas you've seen in most of the countries, um, in most of the countries, they export oil and uh, they import finished products. Government's approach has that we have to export finished products and we can also export oil. So we have a 60,000 barrel refinery as one of the ways to deal with having a finished product. Number two, government acquired 21 square kilometers for an industrial park still around where the refinery will be set. 
and it's under the plans and under now the management of Uganda National Oil Company to make sure that that industrial park is dealing with adding value to the crude to the crude byproducts so that we expose, uh, export finished products. That includes uh, setting up fertilizers, setting up a plastic industry. So all the petrochemical industries are designed to be in that industrial park. Government has acquired land. You know, Uganda National Oil Company is taking that forward. So from the start, government is looking at finished products for the oil and gas sector rather than dealing with raw materials. The second question was how do Ugandans benefit? From the discovery, we had a, Uganda, uh, a policy of 2008, the National Oil and Gas Policy. It recognized the importance of national participation and the importance of skills development. Objective 7 and 8 of that policy. Government has further put in place the relevant laws. One of the laws that are specific for national participation are the national content regulations that are attendant regulation to the Petroleum Acts. These provide for Ugandan participation. Now, it is set in the law that one first priority, whether in employment or business, is given to Ugandan company and Ugandan citizen. If that's not possible, a joint venture. It's only when the joint venture is not possible that an international contractor can be given a job and he makes sure that he subcontracts Ugandans for the packages. So these are all in the laws. Also, there was a ring fencing where 16 services, including logistics, that have been earmarked and ring fenced for Ugandan companies when they are able to deliver them. So it's one of the enablers. So things we don't expect among us, it's civil work, logistics, computer services, environmental studies, 16 services that give Ugandan companies and people go ahead, uh, a, a step ahead in making sure they participate. So we have the, the legal framework in place, we've put in place the institutional framework, we've put in place tools like the National Supplier Database where Jennifer got information from easily from the public without even asking uh, from the PAU. These are things that are facilitating Ugandans to be able to participate. So there are many programs that are in place that where Ugandans are planning and government is continuing to put. We have a specific national content department that I work in, specifically meant to look out in contracting. Are Ugandans participating? Why are they not participating? What can we do? So I think it's a unique sector. We don't have other sectors where you have a specific team of people trying to ensure that Ugandans actually participate. Lastly, Kabale, when it is opening, uh, it's under the Ministry of Works, but as uh, per the last reports, it's over 40% 40, 40 completion. So definitely we have about 60%, and probably by the end of uh, next year, we'll have an international airport bringing in heavy cargo to be able to work in the oil and gas sector. Thank you very much, Tony. Thank you very much. And maybe just to add on to that, as they bring in heavy cargo, we need to be taking out something. Exactly. So our agriculture has to be boosted and made Exactly. To the standard, so we are exporting something. We're exporting the something, and I'm glad that agriculture development program is coming up. Yeah. I'm glad Standwick Incubator is also using private efforts to yeah. make sure that planes bring in equipment, fly yeah. out with tomatoes. Okay, thank so, so, so thank you very much, James, and that was very interesting. And I guess, again, information is key. You have provided so much information on your website, and I think it's only fair that uh, any Ugandan can actually go to your website or walk to the Petroleum Authority and get this information. Yes. We shouldn't have this thing of chinechitu chabanene. You know, this is for a certain group of people. It is for all Ugandans, and I think we need to appreciate that. So, again, Petroleum Authority is doing a great job on that. Now, let me just go to Timothy Tigaikara. Some questions coming in from someone anonymous. Is Sinok going to do a rerun of the tenders? That is number one. And then number two, how do we get access to the list of shortlisted logistics contractors? So that is if you have one. Then the other question, again, to Timothy, which I want to... Uh, forgive me, but I want to just load all questions to you at once. Uh, the other question is um, uh, from, uh, from Samwiri. He's asking, are there any Ugandan IT firms that have been able to get Sinoc contracts? And he's also asking, which areas would Sinoc and other players be willing to look at for local IT resourcing? Local IT resourcing. And then finally, from uh, uh, Christopher Boyondo, he's asking, as a local filmmaker, I would like to know if Sinoc plans to involve some of us with some of us with creative ideas that would contribute to the development of the oil and gas sector. And finally, finally, um, Roy, 
uh, uh, is asking, when should we expect bid inv invitations for local content works? I think which is the same as the first one. And then, of course, as stakeholders in the oil and gas institutions, he works, I think, for a financial institution. No, he does work for a financial institution. He's asking, how can, how can he access data of pre-qualified companies to be able to proactively support them, especially in the bidding and working capital requirements, which are definitely of need? Timothy. Uh, thank you, Tony. <coughs> I would start by answering question one. When are, are the bids going to be rerun? Yes, they're going to be rerun. Uh, I started with that when I was making the first presentation because the ones we had have expired. The environment has changed. So we, are, we have no choice to come back to the market with a new specification for our requirement. When are they going to be rerun? These bids are going to come on board after FID. Reason being is currently we have other bids that are running which we are evaluating. Two, for these logistic services, they are going to transport the engineering equipment. So we need to issue contracts for the engineering projects. The engineering projects, people are going to first design and also procure. So they can only be available for transport after four or five months after FID or after signing the engineering contract. So we still have time to run a tender for logistic services. We don't want to fall into a trap where you run these tenders early, then it takes another one year to have this uh, equipment or cargo available for transport when the bids have expired, like what we are falling into. So. Uh, just immediately after FID, we'll have these tenders or in papers. The second question was about have IT firms benefited in Uganda, if I'm to understand it that way. Very much, all our systems are IT based, from purchase of equipment, from s supply of softwares, uh, from supply of internet links, we have couple of IT uh, firms doing business already with Sinoc. IT is also gazetted for Ugandan companies and Ugandan citizens. W these projects, we advertise them every three years, and they're under a category of small, pro small procurements. So they cannot have a contract of more than three years. So every three years, we have new contracts coming in. Uh, there's a question about how do you involve people to be creative or creative minds yeah. they're the creative industry the filmmakers how do they come into this uh, equation the Olanga story yes uh, you need to understand also about the industry we are in the oil and gas our major objective is to go to the oil fields put equipment pull it out and s send it to the market. That is the interest of the oil companies and the interest of the government. Now, this creative mind, it is there, but very minimal. It's not a core. I can say the creative mind, the vi m video industry. The last time we sent a contract was when we were opening our Kingfisher Access Road. Mm. That was around 2016. I've not seen a requirement where we need to come and do some video conferencing or something. But on a small basis, like when we have conferences, we invite them. They are part of our suppliers. Maybe in future when we reach production and we have to document a lot of things and show the world what we have come through, we'll have opportunities for that. The last question was about how do we access the database of the pre-qualified bidders. Uh, we share this. I can say at the moment we don't have a platform, but uh, it's something they can take away from this conference. And uh, maybe on the website, we can be able to put a list of those who have been pre qualified. That's a takeaway from today. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Timothy. That was uh, a very interesting. But let me just go to you, Patrick. Patrick, 
QHS and E, man. I mean, this is something that is very foreign to many businesses. The only time that we started knowing much about health and safety was when Corona hit us. Before Corona, many businesses did not even think about HSC or health and safety being something important for their businesses. Do you have, because this is what is being asked on Slido, do you have a, 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 a website or a platform where you talk about all of these requirements in terms of health and safety? For the local businesses if i want to procure if i want to support sino probably uh with say transportation or i want to provide my vehicles to be used by sino where is there a place where i can go and look at the requirements and make sure that by the time i come to sino my fleet actually corresponds with your requirements all right thank you tony as what timoth has said um actually uh, at the moment we do not have uh a specific website where you can find these uh, informations but however this is like a takeaway we are going to go back and then we try our level best however what we try our, be our level best to do is uh, we get so much involved in socializing such requir requirements during the quarterly mm. workshops and so on so at least every quarter there is an element of QHSC that is being discussed uh, uh, like what Timothy has said, it's going to be a takeaway. So we shall try our level best to socialize this on any platform. I think this is really, really great. And again, uh, um, uh, these events, these um, uh, platforms that we have, like this e-conference today, is a great way of you know getting the public to understand that we really need to have businesses understanding that health and safety is very important but also at the stand big business incubator we have been training local businesses for the last two years on health and safety it's one of those areas that we are passionate about and we do it according to industry standards interestingly we actually use industry experts to do this training so when you apply for the business incubator program as an oil and gas company you are sure of getting that support and again bid management like uh, Jennifer mentioned very very key and Jennifer this now brings me back to you having been in the game for some time and you're still struggling with bid management imagine how many businesses uh, do not actually understand this doesn't this now bring back into motion or into perspective the whole idea of partnerships I want us to go back to partnerships because you see typical Ugandan businesses are chino chintu change yeah? you know it's, it's my thing it's my deal and yet when we look at the opportunities they are quite huge Tell me, from your experience, how has it been for you since you began and where you're projecting yourself to go? How can you support the small guy to be part of you? Um, I, I think I've had the experience of both where I'm participating alone mm. and where I have partnered with international organization. And I think my response would be is um, we need to come to that place of wisdom to understand and appreciate what we can do and what we can't do. And be able to indeed say, look, I have competences to go through this bid management alone, or I can ride on someone's skills and experience on how to manage these bids. And then I will still benefit. Because I, I think that is the place. The, 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 um, my experience with dealing with an international company doing bid management, it was good that I did that because there are certain questions that I wouldn't have been able to answer on my own in terms of satisfying the mm. bid requirement. But I think when, or I, I rather through that experience I understood the importance and um, the value of partnering. Because either way, all we are looking for is opportunity. Because uh, uh, at, at this point, again, that's what I was, some people even, people have talked to, they are saying, you know what? Going through that bid thing, I would rather not. Mm. <laughs> and so I think that is going to take us to that place of wisdom of saying, look, I can still benefit by subcontracting. However, even subcontraction, because uh, subcontracting, because the bid requirements that, uh, requires that the subcontractee should also meet certain standard requirement so i can rather uh, concentrate on making sure that i meet these standards and the bid management i leave it to the partner because eventually i think that's what is going to happen mm -hmm. so that for me that is the advice or the, um, the the way i would respond to it right. that yes we need to come to that place of knowing I can do this, but I can't do that. Right. But I will identify the partner as long as 
I do not disqualify the partner by not me fulfilling the basic requirements and the standards, especially the standards. Absolutely. Yes. And again, also knowing that it's a very capital intensive industry, mm -hmm. it also, you know, requires a lot of uh, expertise, which yes. many of us to be honest with you, it's the inconvenient we truth. Not. We are not yet there. Yes, yes. Um, that, I think, for me is a very interesting one. And again, that now takes me to Arthur. Arthur, you have tried to get into partnerships with international firms. And again, many businesses have used this as a way of gaining a lot of uh, technical knowledge or know-how and how to operate and do things better. How has your experience been at SPEDAG? Uh, we've, we've had so many partnerships. Um, one, for someone to approach you to be a partner, you need to demonstrate your capacity. You need to demonstrate that you you can actually do the job. You need to be you need to have done your homework. The basics that you need to have done. It's not it's not that anyone is going to international company is just going to come and pick X Y Z company. No, they they'll profile you. They'll look at what have you done. What are you going to bring on the table? Um, so. The partnerships we've done, we've, we've done so many projects with interna uh, bigger international companies that are if in different locations, but these uh, partnerships have been, one, been built on honesty. Uh, we, no one wants to be uh, cheated in any way. It should be a win-win situation. So as we get into these partnerships, let it be to a win-win situation. Uh, the business of uh, trying to hide costs, trying to increase your margins, at the end of the day comes back to bite you. Or else, at the end of the day, you don't even win the project. Because I'll give an example. Some of the international companies will come and they may not be logistics companies, they could be EPCs, the mm -hmm. companies going to the construction. They come and partner with us, but what you feed them, the, the, the information you feed them, the, the, the rates you give them, build up onto their final proposals. Mm -hmm. So. As we get into these partnerships, let's be very open, honest, uh, do your homework well, don't, don't, uh, he, he, they'll give you two weeks to come up with a proposal and you want to work on it two days to the deadline. It doesn't work that way. So a lot of time, effort has to be put in, in, mm -hmm. in, in, in preparing for these partnerships. Thank you very much. Yeah. So thank you very much, Arthur and uh, Jennifer, Jennifer, for those very uh, personal industry uh, experiences. Um, I'm just going to end with the last question, which goes to James Moshere. Uh Someone is asking, kindly estimate for us the uh, total number of employees that are expected to participate in the entire project. Thank you. Um, Tony, uh, we did a, an industrial baseline survey. We also did a capacity needs analysis study. Uh, these studies showed the number of people required for the sector and about 15,000 jobs will be created directly to work for the projects, the three different projects, Tilenga, Kingfisher, Ecop, uh, Refinery. Um, out of those uh, 15,000 are direct, we'll have about 100 and uh, we have about 40, 45,000 which are indirect, that means you're not directly working on the field or anything, but you're working for companies like uh, Unisav or Spedag in, in bringing the equipment and doing that. So those are indirect jobs created. And then we have the induced, um, the 105,000 induced jobs that are as a result of the project itself. Uh, the project has come up, I'm setting up a, a camp nearby, I'm providing uh, meals outside for the truck drivers, I, I'm providing uh, other utens, uh, saloon services. So we estimate about okay. 150,000 jobs or so to be created uh, in the sector. Thank you very much, James. That has been a very comprehensive one. I would like to thank James, Timothy, Jennifer, and of course, Arthur and Patrick. You've been very, very interesting, and your knowledge is uh, one that, of course, two hours could not uh, really do justice to. But I guess we have the ability to keep interacting. And of course, our Slido platform is open for the next uh, few days. I would like to thank JP Wong for putting together these very interesting um, quarterly uh, forums. We had the first one uh, that focused on uh, different, uh, different sector. We had the second one, the third one, focusing on agriculture. And of course, now, the fourth one and the final one focusing on the logistics sector. Areas where we believe if we got Ugandans talking, preparing, and planning, we can participate 
and make some money out of this oil and gas story. I would like to thank Sinuk, Uganda Limited, and of course, the Stanbic Business Incubator for putting this together. Thank you very much and have a good afternoon. You've been a very great audience. Thank you. Sinok Uganda, in partnership with JP Wonk Energy and Stambik Business Incubator, will hold Sinok Quarter for Oil and Gas Supplier Development e-conference. The theme, Preparedness of Logistics Players and Entities for the Development Fairs of the Oil and Gas Sector in Uganda. Hosted by Tony Okoa Otoa, the Chief Executive Stambik Business Incubator. The discussants will